There was nothing that could explain what he saw. It's surreal to have a three-year-old talking about death. Feels creepy. Do you feel the person that's trying to ask for help from you is my Sean? Things go on in the world that I don't fully understand. I can't make this memory go away. I don't know what to do. I can't stand the thought that my granddaughter is having these visions of being on a burning plane. He started pointing up at the sky and saying, those are the portals. He described watching himself get covered in rubble. I said, who are you talking to? And she goes, to those people. And she turned around looked at him and she goes, they're on fire. I had so much anger and rage. I loved him, but I was afraid. I felt super powerless. He was reliving it almost every night, and it was really horrifying to hear that. It upsets me greatly. I don't know how you get past that. We searched and we searched, and Sean was nowhere to be found. He would talk about all the bodies in the water. I couldn't save them. I was sure this warrior was helping him. I was worried. I was concerned. It's okay. Speaking of all the people on the roof. Oh, wow. That's something that only certain people know. Yeah. It's almost unbelievable. It is a miracle. I can smell my son. He confirmed a lot in my mind that maybe there is an afterlife. I don't see how it can be anything else. My name is Bennett. My friend did work at World Trade Center, and he died on 9-11. I'm a little apprehensive of it, about meet, meeting Cade, kind of skeptical about the whole thing. I've never been through this before. I grew up in Florida. Land O'Lakes is just on the outskirts of Tampa. Typical suburban neighborhood. <laughs> I married my husband, Rick, 11 years ago. We grew up together. She's like, I guess, literally the girl next door. Cade was our surprise seven years ago. When my son was born, it was an amazing experience, of course. The first time I held Cade in my arms was amazing because I wasn't supposed to be able to have children. Cade was different. He was like an old man. He just always looked at you like, what are you and who are you? Cade was an early crawler, early talker, early walker, early everything. At one and a half, two years old, he was using very intricate words, very intelligent words. He could hold conversations with adults. It was around the age of three that Kate started talking about that he remembers dying. I would be in bed and Kate would just start crying in the middle of the night. And he would wake up screaming about working in a tall building and that he could see the Statue of Liberty from his office. He told me he dreamt that he was falling with the building like the way he died. It's surreal to have a three-year-old talking about New York and talking about death. Honestly, I started to think, could he have been? Could it be? Could he have been in the World Trade Center? It was around the age of three that Kate started talking about death, and it was overwhelming. Very dramatic, frightening nightmares. Honestly, I started to think, could he have been in the World Trade Center? But there was a huge part of me that said, wait a minute, that, that can't be. It can't be. We didn't show him anything. He did. There was no way he could have known about him. 
No one in my family knows anyone involved in the World Trade Center, and he's never been to New York. I just thought he had a vivid imagination. A little bit later, he became obsessed with planes. At first, Cade was totally petrified by the airplanes, like they were monsters. He wasn't scared of them being in the air. It's more like he was scared of where they were going. Cade is a seven-year-old now, and to this day, Cade around tall buildings is frantic. Hi. That feels creepy. I just don't like to look up. I would not like to go in that tall building. No. He doesn't want to be around them. He doesn't want to come close to them. That big shiny one looked just like the Twin Tower. It brings back a lot of memories, but I'm not going in, OK? I was worried. I was concerned. It finally did get to the point where I couldn't deny it anymore. Something really bad was happening. It finally did get to the point where I couldn't deny it anymore. Something really bad was happening. I remember vividly the first time Cade began to describe being under the building and hitting the ground. And he just flat out said that he was in a building that was hit by something. That it exploded. And that he had fallen. And he described to us in great detail seeing himself from above and him hitting the ground and watching himself get covered in rubble. What you say when a three-year-old tells you if you're falling from a long way, you can hear your insides rattle. I was shocked and really upset. Me and my mother stepped away and cried. Everything, kind of the pieces, suddenly came together like a puzzle. The planes, the tall buildings, this person was at the World Trade Center. Kate has facts. There's no way he could know. He was born after 9-11, and we never allowed him to watch that type of thing. The plane hit the World Trade Center. Then it got stuck in the building. When I was falling, I was still alive, and then all the rubble hit me. I didn't feel anything because I died. I'm feeling very sad for him because I don't imagine a man going through this. I imagine my baby going through this. When he describes it, to me, it's my Cade. This is happening to him. I don't know how you get past that. I mean, life has so many things happen that you have to get past. How do you get past remembering that? At this point, Cade started asking me to change his name, that he didn't like Cade. He was just very insistent that Cade was not his name. I had a name now. So I went online and I posted Kate's story on a web board, hoping that other people would maybe help me find answers. And it was actually another mother who sent me the link. And she said there was a man that worked in the World Trade Center. And he died on 9-11. His life mimics what Kate describes his life and his death was. I was absolutely shocked, absolutely. I had to tell everyone I found it. I pulled up the obituary, the pictures. I've done the investigation. I've made the connection, and now I know. I know the truth. I know who he was. I know how he died. But as a mother, I'm feeling very helpless. 
I can't make this memory go away. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix this. My husband and I have been lost for seven years on how to raise Cade. Cade's situation now in the neighborhood is uh, bleak. There are people in the neighborhood who don't want their kids to play with Cade. Cade has a hard time with other kids his age, and it's making his childhood miserable. Every friend he's ever told the story to has called him a liar and laughed at him. I'm heartbroken, absolutely heartbroken. You just want, want everybody to like your kid. <laughs> if they would just open their mind a little bit and understand. I'm hoping that this trip can end a chapter for Cade and he can let his past self go and learn how to be a kid again. My name is Cade. I want to let go of this past life because it's brutal. Doing this is so important that I'm going to go even though I'm afraid of flying in airplanes. I believe that it's time for Cade to move on and be Cade. I'm excited for Cade to meet a former friend of his from his former life. I think it'll be good for both of them. I'm excited for Cade to ask questions and get answers and see if they can connect. My name is Ben. My friend he did work at World Trade Center, and he died on 9-11. Cade's got all these memories about something in the past. Being a parent, I can feel for them because you want to help the child so they can get past whatever they need to get past. Hopefully, I can help this young boy become OK with his life. I'm looking forward to visiting one of my friends from my old life. I have a lot of questions that you can answer for me. Hello, hello, I'm Ben. Hey, hello. I'm Molly. Hi. Hi, hello. how are you? Do you remember stuff from work? I was supposed to be fixing either a satellite or television or maybe a cable. Yes, you worked at World Trade fixing cameras, you know, studio type stuff, videotape machines. Do you remember going to work, going to the Trade Center? I either walked or rode a bike, oh, because I remember living, like, not far from it, so I didn't have to take, like, a car to there. It was a few blocks away. That's right. That, that's, that, is, that is right. Yes. It is? Yes. That's why he was the guy to go to any time he had problems with World Trade, because he didn't have to commute, really. Oh. Yeah, it's almost unbelievable. Didn't, didn't, like, the house get robbed that I used to live at? Yes. Remember him selling me? Wow. What was he doing at work that day? He wasn't supposed to be there. We didn't, it was supposed to be, um, there was another guy that called in sick. Oh. Wow. So now with like speaking of all the people on the roof when the first plane impacted. You were speaking to people on the roof? Yeah. Is that what you remember, being on the roof? That's what we always thought, too. We always thought the guys made it to the roof. Yeah, he always said he was on the roof and then the door then locked. Oh, geez. wow. That I knew. I mean, that's something that only certain people know, you know. Yes, the door was locked. The door was locked. Yeah, to get to the roof. Wow. Before I met Cade, I was skeptical about this whole situation, but he confirmed a lot in my mind. He's recalling a lot of things he wouldn't have known that proved that there is something more going on, that maybe there is something after, you know, an afterlife. I mean, I was shocked because I didn't think that would check out. Right. I came in here being the most skeptical out of the bunch and not, you know, believing a lot of it, but, you know, y'all meeting here today and talking about stuff and you actually being able to confirm some of the things, or, it, it, I guess, you know, maybe there is something more after this. I guess you know, one day we will all find out. I hope this helps you guys. I hope it helps solidify something in your lives. It definitely does. You help, you help me a lot. Yeah, you think so? I feel way better to know 
that I was actually correct about what happened with my past life. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice meeting you guys. Thank nice meeting you, you guys. So much. Nice meeting you guys. I think Kate got a lot of validation today that his memories are real, that he's telling the truth. Thank you. Let's make you a dumb bum. Goodbye. It's absolutely amazing. This is where you were. I feel like this will really be a positive thing for Cade to put that part behind him. Never forget, of course, but to help him overcome those nightmares. There it is. There it is. There it is. To see the name memorialized made everything feel very real. I just sketched my name on a piece of paper at the memorial site and kind of feel better about doing that because now I have the name on my plaque. I have that forever now. You have that forever and ever. I just said goodbye to my past life. I don't know how I know, but it just is gone. The only thing I have left is memories. But my name will always be there at the memorial site. I think that's awesome. Welcome to your new life. Oh, my gosh. Kate, who was able to say goodbye, and we can open a new chapter. Since coming to your north, I'm no longer scared of flying heights or tall buildings. Two fears in one day. That's a pretty, pretty big accomplishment. And that's really going to change my life. I'm Ariel. I'm Jude's mom. Hello, my name is Trevor, and I'm Jude's father. We live in Seattle. It's mostly known for the Space Needle, the beautiful mountains, Mount Rainier, and just tons of wilderness and exciting places to explore. Jude was always different than my other two because when he was first born, he had problems crying. My husband was going to law school, and so and it was really difficult because he would cry every night. Pretty much happened the same time. It was almost like clockwork. I would do anything I could to get him to stop crying when he was a baby. I don't know what it was. It wasn't like he was necessarily in physical pain, but there was certainly something that was going on with him when he would cry. Other babies, you'd be able to, like, console them in some way. And he was almost unconsolable. It was really difficult. I mean, it made me sad and feel almost helpless that I couldn't help him stop crying. So now he sleeps with us because his crying was so much that it would keep everybody else awake. And he's never spent a night actually by himself. Jude was really an early talker. He loved talking. Hi, Daddy. As time progressed, he started saying things that were just, you know, what I would consider off the charts. Come with me to God's work. It's, it's just really unique and different. The good angels are way more cooler, but he still has white wings. As Jude got older, his sleeping problems got worse. He started waking up at about two and a half. Jude would wake up, he would just kind of start stirring in bed. You would hear him kind of like moaning and eventually, you know, within five minutes would turn into like full, full on screaming and crying. It just seemed like he was having horrible, horrible dreams. We would try to convince him that whatever the nightmare was, was over. My husband and I didn't really know. We didn't know what the answer was. We did take him to the pediatrician. We said he's having problems sleeping and it's affecting him during the day because he's not as like upbeat and happy as he can be. Our pediatrician actually just recommended that he was having night terrors. Unfortunately, he didn't 
really have a, you know, he didn't have a solution. I did actually feel a little frustrated because I was hoping there would be a medical explanation that we could fix. It made my other two children very upset and it un unnerved them. It was, uh, it was a very difficult time for us. As he's gotten older, he's able to describe more, telling us that he's having horrible dreams at night, that he's afraid that he's gonna die. Why would a little boy be worried about dying? Then things started to get really weird. When Jude was two and a half, we were all lying in bed together, and he just kept looking up at the ceiling, kind of smiling, this little smile. And we were like, what are you doing, Jude? What are you looking at? And he's just pointed up, and he's like, I'm looking at the angels, mommy. They're smiling at me. I was shocked. I wasn't raised any religion. I didn't grow up going to church. I never talked about angels with my children. But Jude talks about angels all the time. It's kind of hard being an angel. Jude says, without a doubt, that he was an angel up in heaven before he came here. The only angel that survives yeah. is the voice he won. And he says his name up in heaven. I don't know what to make of it. And then one day when we were at the park, he started pointing up at the sky and saying, those are the portals. Mommy, I see the portals, they're right there. And I was like, portals, what are you talking about? Portal is a huge word for a three-year-old. And he's like, don't you see them? They're right there, they're the dark spots in the sky. He started talking about how he came through a portal and came into my body. What do you mean? He said, those are the portals and they connect to heaven. And that's how you get from heaven to earth. You come through the portals. I was really shocked when he used the word portal. I was completely shocked to even think that there could be some connection to heaven and the fact that he would come up with that idea. And then things took a turn. I'm from Arkansas. I'm headed to try to help Lexi. She has had uh, visions of a plane crash where I had two sisters killed. Lexi knows a lot of details that a four-year-old child would not normally know. Michelle Johnston. I live in Mount Pleasant, Tennessee. Mount Pleasant is located in Middle Tennessee, just about 50 miles south of Nashville. I love living in Mount Pleasant. There's a lot of history, and it's a peaceful community. I'm Carson. I'm 20. I'm a stay-at-home mom to my daughters, Alexis and Lily. Lexi, since she came into the world, there's something about her. She's different. And she does different things than other children. And when at six months old, she would take a pencil and hold it the proper way. Most children grasp it with a fist. Lexi holds it like an adult. It was, you know, kind of shocking. It wasn't a fluke thing. She did it correct every time. Lexi was home from the hospital, and she had bad sleep patterns. Minutes after we lay her down, she'd wake up and she'd be crying. She'd actually scream a lot of the time, terrified. We tried moving the crib into our bedroom, but that didn't work either. Several trips to the emergency room, back and forth to pediatricians. There was never anything wrong. We just couldn't explain why Lexi couldn't sleep. Then she started having extreme night terrors. Lexi's screaming. She's pulling at her hair. 
She's pulling at our hair. She's screaming, help me. I'm scared. And that continued for weeks. And then the weeks turned into months. So my thought was, this is just not right. Children don't do this. It was breaking my heart to watch Lexi have to go through this, not sleeping, grinding her teeth, crying. I thought the night terrors were something that's eventually gonna go away, but you know, we were up for a challenge. The first time I noticed something strange, Alexis would have conversations with people who weren't there. My 13-year-old daughter said Lexi was creepy. She certainly made you stop and look, peek around the corner, and second guess what's there. It was breaking my heart to watch Lexi have to go through this. Things started to turn a little scarier, I think, at this point. One afternoon, Lexi's playing in the dirt, and she gets up and walks over to the tree line, and she's standing there talking. I said, who are you talking to? And she goes, to those people. She says, there are two of them. So we're all looking at each other thinking, what are we getting ready to find out now? So I said, what do they look like? And she turned around and looked at me, and she goes, they're on fire. I didn't know how to feel about that. It was a little scary. It's one thing to have an imaginary friend. She says she sees it. She's not old enough to lie to me yet. I've got this two-year-old baby explaining horrific things. I just don't know what to do. We live close to a small airport. The first time a plane flew over, she freaked out. She starts screaming and crying. She's running across the yard trying to get to someone. So I scooped her up, I'm like, it's okay, baby, it's okay. And she starts screaming, it's going to fall, it's going to fall. No, 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 baby, I said, it's just an airplane, it's not going to fall. She says, oh, yes, it is. Carson had decided to ask her, have you ever been on a plane? And Lexi answered her, yes. Which kind of shocked us all, because Lexi has never been on a plane. We said, what happened to your plane, Lexi? She goes, it's raining, lots and lots of rain. She said, and thunder. I said, was there a storm? She goes, bad storm, bad storm. And I'm like, are you OK? And she goes, no, no. I want to help Lexi through this. I don't know what to do. What can I do? I was really starting to believe that Alexis, my granddaughter, was remembering a past life. Any mom who has a baby they can't console, you just mostly feel sad that there's nothing you can do. You know, you've tried everything. Our other two children did not do this, and we were concerned there was something wrong with our son, Jude. Then he started saying something unusual. About a year ago, when Jude was three, he would start drawing. He would ask me repeatedly to help him draw himself as like a, a boy. What color? And he would say that he was the rainbow boy. Rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. And then he would instruct me, like, how to draw the rainbows on the boy. OK, anything else? It looks like him, like a boy like him, except for his body would be all rainbows. And then he would have a cape also that was like a rainbow cape. He said that he was the rainbow warrior. When he was telling me how to color, I didn't really understand what it all was. 
But I would soon find out that the Rainbow Warrior was more than just a cute drawing. Jude started talking more and more about angels and other religious things, and so I thought that I might get some answers if I took him to a nearby church. Jude's just kind of wandering around. Then he made a beeline to the robes, the priest's robes, and he started touching them, like, almost obsessively. I'm like, stop. These are the priest's things, and they're not for you to touch. And then after that, there was this Bible, this huge Bible, and it was underneath and, like, tucked under, so you almost couldn't see it. He ran up to that Bible. He goes, this is Jesus' Bible. And he's like, this is so precious. He goes, you mustn't touch it. And I was just in awe. He'd never seen a Bible before. I'd never showed him a Bible. I mean, he talked about God, but before that, I didn't really realize how actually really, really religious he was. We don't go to church. We don't read the Bible. Um, I don't want to say we're atheists, but we're, we're certainly not the, the religious type of people that you might meet. For the most part, everything Jude was telling us was all really sweet, and then things started changing. Jude said something that really scared me. He started talking obsessively about a plane crash. I, a part of me was concerned. Jude was my third child, and the way he talked about things was like none of my other children. I was scared. I had no idea where he was getting this information. There was one thing that he started talking about every day, and it really scared me, and it was about this plane crash. He would talk about the plane crash pretty much every night before we went to bed. He was almost like he was in a trance-like state. He would talk about all the bodies in the water. So many bodies in the water. I couldn't save them. The details of the plane crash were agonizing. I don't know where he would be getting this information from. We didn't really talk about planes very much and I would never, ever mention planes crashing. But it was really graphic and horrifying to hear that. He'd say, so many bodies, Mommy, so many bodies. He said it so many times. He would say things like, I want to save them, Daddy. Can you help me save them? And he'd, he'd say, they're dying, Daddy. And uh, it upsets me. It upsets me greatly. Why would a, a young child talk about things that they have no understanding of and no experience with and talk so emotionally about them to the point of, uh, of hysteria as though they were actually there? It was like he was actually reliving it almost every night. He wanted to save them. And that was the hardest thing, is there was nothing I could do to convince him that it wasn't his responsibility. I'd never seen that kind of guilt with any of my other children. Jude will cry about things that an adult who's been through, it seems like a war, would cry about. Pent up feelings about things that, um, quite frankly, I can't explain. I don't want to believe in things that don't exist, but I know, I know that he, he believes what he says, and because he's my child, I'm not going to not believe him. People have talked about reincarnation, and I've considered that it could be a reality, but I never truly believed in it. I never really knew it to be true. I was trying to explain it on my own. I thought, Maybe he saw something on TV, like a news flash or something, but Jude's description was so clear and his anguish was so great that to me it seemed like there was no other option than it had to be something he remembered from another time. I thought that perhaps it was a past life. I didn't know what to do.
I believe that Alexis, my granddaughter, was remembering a past life. I was really starting to worry about her. I had had speculation before, like when she was talking to the people that we couldn't see. Out of the blue, I told my mama one day, I said, that baby's connected to the past. Then, you know, that's all this can be. Two to three weeks after that, she started describing in full detail that plane crash. Lexi has told me the story more than once that she was on the plane with a younger sister. She said, everybody screamed. She goes, I'm falling, my plane is falling. And here come the little tears again. Just, they're just running down her cheeks to the point where they're dripping off the bottom of her chin. And she turned around and she said, I can't fly. And that's when Lexi breaks down and just starts to sob. I can't stand the thought that my granddaughter is having these visualizations of being on a burning plane that's crashing and she knows she's not getting out of it. I wanted some answers about this plane so that I could help Lexi. One day, I run across a coloring page. Just as I crumbled it up to throw it away, I realized that there were numbers written on the page and it said 866. I thought, oh, somebody was writing down one of those 800 numbers and didn't finish it. Uh, I went ahead and wadded it up and threw it in the garbage, and I, then I got thinking, no one's been here. She just colored those. So I come in here and I got it back out of the garbage and I looked at it again. So I thought, well, it's worth a shot. There had to be two sisters very close in age on board this plane. So I typed in plane crash of flight 866. I didn't really turn up anything, but then I typed in plane crash of August 1966 and up pops this horrible plane crash. The plane caught on fire and began to break apart. So I pulled up a passenger list of the plane. The first name on the list was a military serviceman. The very next two names were sisters, a Nancy Chamberlain, age 18, and a Susan Chamberlain, age 15. Could this be Lexi? I'm Buzz. I'm not real sure about how far my beliefs go with reincarnation, but uh, there's no telling what could come out of this. I'm Buzz, and Lexi has had uh, visions of a plane crash from 1966 where I had two sisters killed. I'm not real sure about how far my beliefs go with reincarnation, but uh, I mean, there's no telling what could come out of this. I think this is just gonna be most beneficial for Lexi. Just since the last taping, with us constantly talking about it and constantly letting her get her feelings out, Lexi's been able to sleep by herself, sleep with the lights off, sleep all night long. So I think getting to meet the person who may have been her brother in the past life, I think is just gonna help her really come to terms with everything that, that's happened. This is Alexis, we call her Lexi. Hi Lexi, how are you darling? Let me say hi. playing with her outside. I'm just gonna test her. So she was playing and I said, hey, Barbara. Didn't even look at me. And um, I waited a few minutes. I said, hey, Nancy. And she snapped, she said, what? And I said, ah. Oh. And she goes, you did call me Nancy. I said, yes, I did. She said, I like that name. I said, I do too. Hmm. So. It's uncanny. Mm-hmm, I thought so. Would you like to see a picture? I would love to. <laughs> All right. These are Nancy and Susan. This is Susan. This is Nancy. That's their last school pictures. Wow. And that's Susan. Oh. What do you think of those pictures? Pretty. Very pretty. Wow, big. They were. She looked familiar to you? 
She does. It's almost surreal. I'm kind of like in shock a little bit or in awe. You think you know wow. her? You do. Wow. And it gave me validation that, yeah, we did have the right sisters. Just the most tender-hearted child. She's just the most caring little thing. You know, she'll say, hey, you look good today. Oh, well, thank you. So do you, you know? <laughs> or, you know, just comment on anything. She said, Mimi, I like your yard. She said, did you mow it? You're Mimi? Uh-huh. That was my mother's name for the grandkids, that. Mimi. Yeah. Because they were supposed to call me something else. And when she started saying words, she, she immediately started calling me Mimi. I said, she's calling me Mimi. That's, uh, yeah. Just lines up, doesn't it? It does. I don't see how it could be anything else. I don't either. There are things go on in the world that I don't know anything about and that I don't fully understand, but because I don't know doesn't mean that it's not true. I, I feel like that I learned today, Lexi is the reincarnation of my sister. So it's, it's been a good thing. Meeting Buzz and talking with him about his sister Nancy and it gave me validation that yeah, we did have the right plane. We did have the right sisters. We were hoping to get some resolve for Lexi, and I, we're definitely going to get it. There's no doubt in my mind that she was Nancy Chamberlain on her past life. With Lexi knowing that she's seen her bigger self, she's got an actual face to put with these memories. Now she knows they're, they're not actually her memories. She was never on a plane. It was Nancy that was on the plane. I think that's going to help Lexi put this, these bad memories to rest and just be her own little self. <laughs>other children didn't have experiences like my son Jude. This was entirely new territory for me and my husband. It was an emotional time for us. I started to wonder if the reason he was having night terrors was because he was dreaming about this past life. I think that it would be reasonable to look into what reincarnation is all about and understand it better. I mean, if he was somebody else and now is, is Jude, which is a continuation of who he would have been, I suppose, um, then that's, that's who he is. I decided to do research to see if there was anything that related to everything that Jude talked about. To find out who Jude was, I started doing research into plane crashes. I looked at everything from World War II to recent plane crashes, and nothing was matching. And then I remembered something, something I had not thought about in years. Back in the 90s, I had this really vivid dream of a plane crash. I actually woke up in the middle of the night sweating and in tears. Over the years, I forgot about it, but that was the missing link I had been looking for. Immediately, TWA 800 popped up, and it crashed after taking off from JFK Airport and all 230 people died. There actually was a chaplain who responded to the call and Jude's name in heaven was the same as this man. And he came to the location of where the crash was and he stayed there with the families for three weeks like a spiritual counselor. Everything collided. I started to see the parallels between the chaplain's life and my son Jude's life. How Jude would know so much about religion and the Bible. If he had in fact been a priest in his other life, then that would make sense that he would carry these memories on. He was a priest, he was a gay rights activist, and there's actually like photos of him in a parade marching right next to a rainbow flag. Jude often drew what he called the Rainbow Warrior. I thought, wow, this is really strange. It was like my heart kind of stopped. 
I started to wonder if Jude actually was the chaplain. All the pieces came together and it brought a kind of peace to me. It brought, it brought an understanding. I, I want to share with Jude the story that I found about this man. I hope that I am doing the right thing if Jude can understand that he had nothing to do with the plane crash, then I'm hoping he can let that guilt go. Our four-year-old son, Jude, seemed to feel responsible for the souls of those who had died. It was so painful to see him that way. The priest story fits so many of the things Jude has said. This is pretty serious stuff to talk about with a four-year-old. But my son has been talking about serious stuff since the moment he could speak. Ready, Jude? Yeah. I'm hoping that if Jude sees the photos, maybe he'll realize that he wasn't responsible. So he can let this feeling of responsibility go. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna show you some photos. If I show you these pictures, we wanna see if you, if you recognize this guy. He was a priest. Okay. There's no way to scientifically prove that Jude actually was the chaplain in his last life, but I think that he certainly has a lot that he can learn from this man. Okay, what about this picture, Jude? Yeah, that's me. I can hardly believe what I'm hearing. This is him when he was younger. Do you remember hmm. anything like wearing a, a robe like that? A bowl? Does that remind you of something? That's me. Jude actually connected with being the chaplain. I'm feeling excited. Hopefully, by recognizing, you know, who he was, he can let go of this guilt, finally. See, you don't need to feel guilty anymore. You didn't do anything wrong. You were just trying to help people. Do you understand that? Yeah. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna send these things out to the water. We're gonna hope that this will help you turn your bad memories to good. Bless it. Bless it? Yeah, just bless it. We're gonna bless them. We're gonna bless them. We decided that a good way for Jude to let go and hopefully overcome some of his bad memories would be to take him out on the water and let these pictures go. We're going to send this off, OK? And hopefully, in doing that, we can move Jude from his past life and more into his present life. Ready? Ready. OK, throw it in the water. There it goes. Bye-bye. There he goes, bye-bye. I really want Jude to feel like he has the whole world ahead of him instead of feeling like he has it on his shoulders. Bye. I really think that by doing all of this and talking about it, there was definitely some closure. And I hope he can just focus on being, you know, who he is, just being Jude and being a fun-loving kid. today. I watched my mom and dad. God just found the lights to mommy. It's been really incredible, all the things that Judas told me, and I've learned an amazing amount and grown, grown a huge amount from everything he said. I definitely believe now that there's something more, a lot more than what we can see, and that it's more complex than just one thing. My name is Lisbeth. I'm Paolo's mom. I was born in Cuba. I have been living in Miami for 16 years. When I saw Miami from the plane, I fell in love with the city. I love the weather. It's warm and sunny. I always dreamed to live in here.
I loved being pregnant. My name is William, I'm Paolo's dad. When my wife said that she was pregnant, I was so excited. I mean, this is something like, just can't imagine what I feel. I was very excited to bring Paolo home from the hospital. It was a very quiet baby, but at night he couldn't sleep at the crib. He was crying all the time. He started like screaming, crying. He just couldn't stand to be alone in the crib, so he was all the time with my wife and myself. I thought he wanted to be in my bed with me, to smell me, because it, it happened to babies. But later on, when he was growing up, he became crazy when I turned off the light. He was like hanging and grabbing my clothes and, Mommy, Mommy, please turn on the light, turn on the light. I felt super powerless because it was like unstoppable. Paolo never slept alone at night. I thought it's gonna pass because everyone is afraid of darkness when you're a kid. And him is still there. Paolo still is afraid of the dark. When he became two and a half, he was restless. He became kind of angry. He was like mad, angry, moving all the time. His temper, he was like kind of rough. So he always scared me a little bit. It was super difficult for me. I loved him, but I was afraid. He had like this dark force inside of him, this anger. It was like a part of him that was pushing him to be like that. And I could, I could see it. He was kind of like he was always in a battle. I thought it was a phase. But then we started to notice uh, differences. He started talking about Japan. Everything was Japan and swords. He was fascinated with katana swords, which is a Japanese sword. He said, Mommy, I love katanas. He just said the word katana. He just knew the word. He was familiar with that word. I never talked about Japan, but he seems to know everything about it. He knew the names of every single sword at that time. It was like something crazy for me. We made swords out of paper, cardboard, and he was like, like this, fighting all the time with the, with the sword. And he was, mommy, I'm a warrior, mommy. I'm gonna fight for honor. And he was obsessed with that. I didn't know where did his obsession with Japanese stuff come from, but I thought it, it, it's harmless. And then Paolo said something that I thought was strange. We were having lunch. Paolo, I think, was like four years, four years and a half. And he said, Dad, when you were not my dad and my mom was not my mom, I used to live in Japan. He said, Mom, don't get hurt. Don't think I'm lying. It was a different type of parents. They were Japanese parents. I live in another country. I got confused because I didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, I was a warrior. I was a Japanese samurai. I had a wife and I had a boy. So I thought, wow. I said to my wife, he's watching too much TV. And I just get a skeptic and I thought it's just a little kid making up stories. What Paolo said made me confused. But what was about to happen changed our lives forever. We were definitely confused and at times scared by Paolo. We weren't really sure what to make of our song. I thought it was just a face, that he will eventually forget about it. But he became to talk more and more, and everything around, around him was Japanese culture. He became obsessed with it. Flowers from Japan, names from Japan. He said the word Kyoto as his city. He told me, Mommy, I used to live in Kyoto. I remember it was Kyoto, my city. 
He kept repeating that he had different parents, that he was a big guy already with a wife and a son, and he used to fight plenty of battles. It was like he was seeing everything in front of his eyes. Sometimes he told me, Mom, I can feel the perfume of the flowers. I can feel the wind in my face. I can hear the chanting of people in the battle. It was like he was living two lives, his life as my son Paolo and this other life as a Japanese guy. At the beginning, I was confused. I thought he was a kid with a huge imagination. But one day, he told me, Mommy, I remember I was dying. I was a warrior. I had my troops. I, I was a leader. And I used to lead my troops at the battlefield in the name of honor. He told me that it was really dark. It was on a battlefield. He was with his troops, but all of them were dead. And he told me, Mommy, I felt like something like dark. Some, something was wrapping me, and I fell, and I died. I was dead. I couldn't believe what was happening. He told me, Mom, it was terrifying. There was no stars, no moon. It was all dark around me. I felt like I had no one. I was dying all by myself in there. It was heartbreaking. I started to wonder, was he remembering a past life? When he was telling me that he was a warrior and he died on a battlefield, that gave me a shivers. You know, it freaked me out a lot. My wife, she always telling me, let him talk, let him express himself to see what happened. But it was too much for me. <laughs> I was born and raised from Catholic background, and we don't believe in reincarnation. I didn't want to go into it. If my son is remembering a past life, I want to know why. Why did he remember what some people don't remember anything at all? I would soon get an answer to that question, and it would tear our world apart. What Paolo said made me confused. I realized it might be that he's having memories of a past life. This was shocking, but nothing prepared us for what happened next. When Paolo was five and a half years old, he started losing weight. He couldn't eat at all. He was always tired. His breath was different, having bruises all over the body, and he was very pale. He used to bleed by the gums and by, by the nose. And I thought, my God, my kid is really bad. There's something wrong with him, and we went to the doctor. Finally, he said, the news are not good. It's leukemia. The time stopped for me. I couldn't hear, I couldn't see, I couldn't move. I was holding him and hugging him, and I was breathing him, and I was, I don't want to lose it. I don't want to lose it. I think there's no word to describe such a thing, you know, when the doctor says that your kid had leukemia, it's like, it's indescribable. The mom and Paolo was diagnosed with leukemia. I told him, the doctor said, you're sick with cancer. It's a very bad illness. He didn't say anything at the beginning, but when we came home, he told me, mommy, I want to go to the bathroom. And it took a while, he was like, more than 30 minutes in the bathroom. And when he came out, he told me that he saw a dark presence and he saw a clear presence, like a light. He told me it was an angel. 
He told me, Mommy, the dark presence told me, Paola, come with me. It's going to end really soon. You're not going to suffer. But then the light presence told me, don't go with him. We're going to fight. It's going to be a long battle, but we're going to win, and you're going to live. Paolo told me that he decided to go with the light presence. And he told me, Mommy, I'm going to fight cancer with my sword because I'm a warrior. And he took the sword and he put it on his back. And he slept with the sword on his back during the four years and a half that he was being treated for cancer. All the doctors knew Paolo was this Japanese guy. And when he came to receive chemo, they told him, hi, warrior, are you coming for your chemo? And he was, yes, I'm going to fight cancer with my sword, so give me my chemo. I was proud of him. The whole four years and a half that Paolo was sick with cancer, he adopted the personality of this Japanese warrior. It was, for me, it was magical. But one day, the doctor came and he gave us the devastating news. Paolo was really bad. He was really sick. They told us that they're going to move Paolo to the intensive care unit. And I asked him why, and the doctor, he told me that they're going to move him because uh, he could die. Our son Paolo was fighting the biggest battle of his life. He was diagnosed with leukemia. I was scared. I thought maybe he's going to die. Paolo was living the life of a Japanese boy. I believe that it would help him. We used to draw the cell cancers, and he used to draw those little warriors with swords killing the cell cancers. And he told me, Mommy, this is how I'm killing the illness with my sword. And he, he visualized that. And I was sure that this warrior that died on the past life was helping him to defeat cancer. One day, Paolo was really bad. The doctor said, and they moved him to the intensive care unit. As a father, I think you always have a hope. But you see too many things in the hospital. You see too many kids pass away. Paolo almost died two times. Once were in the intensive care unit, and the other one was when his liver got no response at all. Doesn't work. He got lungs full of water. He got a fungus on his lungs. His body just didn't react at all. He was in a coma, and he couldn't open his eyes. And the doctors told us that it was a matter of time. He was dying. He was very sick. And for the first time, I thought he was going, he was going to, he, he was going to die. And my husband started crying, and he was losing faith. I was praying and praying and praying, and I asked God to... I was asking him to... to let him be. And then after the fifth day, Paolo just woke up out of the blue and said, oh my God, thank God. And he was like, Dad, don't cry. You know that kids were angels and angels talk with God. And God told me that I'm not gonna die, that I'm gonna die when I grow up and I got grandsons. And I asked him, did you talk to God? And he just smiled at me and he was back, back to sleep. Ten minutes after that, his body started like reacting. The doctor came, he gave me a huge hug, and he said, don't worry, he's gonna make it. It's more than happiness that you feel in your body. And you, I mean, it is a miracle. It is a miracle. I'm pretty sure that his water spirit was helping him to defeat cancer. When Paolo started like talking about past lives, I was in disbelief, but 
he knows too much about the Japanese culture. That's something that he just can't understand. Now I can say that, uh, yeah, he was uh, what he said he was. He was a, a Japanese uh, warrior in his past life. Uh, I'm sure of it. Paulo's been in remission for four years now. I know the cancer is not gonna return, I feel it. It was a proof of faith, a proof of strength. It made our family stronger. My kid changed in every aspect. This anger that he had all the time disappeared. He became more peaceful. He's a different boy now. But there's one fear from this past life that's still haunting him. He's terrified of the darkness. I think he's afraid of the darkness because he died alone in a dark place on his past life. He defeated cancer, but I want to find a way to help him defeat this fear of darkness. Memories of being a Japanese warrior helped my son Paolo to defeat leukemia. But he still has a fear left over from his past life. My name is Paolo. I am 13. In my past life, I was a general. I was a samurai general. I had a happy life in Japan until one day when I went to a field and all my troops were lying dead. And then just out of nowhere, this weird black smoke just comes and envelops me. And I die. I believe that the dark smoke that enveloped me made me afraid of the darkness. In my past life, I've already died of darkness, but I've never died of cancer that I can recall. So I feel like well, I have a better chance of beating cancer than I have of beating the dark. So I would love to get rid of my fear of the darkness. We are going to a sensei here in Miami. He's gonna help Paolo conquer his fears by using these ancient Japanese martial arts of kendo. I hope it's gonna work. How can I help you this afternoon? What are you looking for? I have for? A, a fear of the darkness. You do, son. Okay. I am looking to overcome that fear. My past life, my sensei taught me basically how to be a samurai. And in this life, I use my samurai training to defeat cancer. So I'm hoping that this sensei, he will show me how to overcome my fear of the darkness. How did you defeat cancer? I fought. I said, I will live. I'm not going to give up here. You see, you have to use the same thing for the darkness now for you. Cancer was four years and a half. It was a fight, a short fight for him in this life, but it's been 13 years fighting against darkness. Hopefully he's gonna find a new weapon, so he might use it. You ready to overcome your weaknesses? Yes. It's gonna be a long path, but you can do it. Yeah. Japanese say, kento wa kokoro nari. If you want to study the sword, you must study your mind first, okay? So first step, now we're gonna pretend that your, your left hand is a sword, okay? Come. Step back again, cut me again. I never go back, always go forward. Step forward. So see, you're making a conscious effort to do something. And that's what you have to do outside also in your life. You have to make a conscious effort to take that step, okay? This is amazing. This will make me more of a happy person when I grow up. To fight the darkness, that sword isn't gonna be a solid sword. It's probably gonna be like a mental thing in my mind. It's like, it's gonna be with me, but mentally. But look at the fear like your opponent. Challenge your opponent, I'm not giving in to you not giving in to you. You know, in the beginning, it's gonna be hard. So a small step. Start sleeping separate to them. Not in the same bed, but separate for an hour to see if you can, if you can handle that. Is that something you guys can handle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that course. something you can handle? Yeah. yeah. You can handle that, right? And I think for you guys, it's very important. Yeah, we'll it. do it every single day. When I get home today, I'm gonna to start taking my first small step I'm gonna set a mindset. I'm going to win against the darkness the same way I did with cancer. Okay. Okay. Good, good. 
I feel that he's happy, he feels confident, <laughs> he feels that he can do it, and for me, that's everything, everything. Paul is my hero. He is the bravest kid I ever know. I want Paolo to be whatever he wants to be when he grows up. He's very smart. He's good with friends and people. My goal is him to be happy and achieve his dreams. My name is Jeannie Quinn. I'm the mother of Sean Millette. One day I got a phone call from Ghost Inside My Child and they wanted to do a story concerning my son, Sean Ouellette. And I thought, gee, what is this really about? My son, Jacob, told me a story about how he was murdered with a baseball bat. I was suddenly very afraid because I wasn't sure if he was trying to tell me something he'd remembered or something that he had foreseen. I began to wonder if it could be a past life experience. My name is Jacob. I do remember how I died in my past life. I was in a forest and I heard yelling coming from my own mouth, and then a rush of cold and something hitting me in the side of the head, and I saw a person who was standing dropping a baseball bat. I'd like for Jacob to be able to connect with something that would clarify some of his past life for him. I have decided to share my research with Jacob and feel it's maybe unfair not to. And I'm hoping that maybe he can make a connection with one of these stories. And if he does, that we can put all these things behind us. Ron Matthews killed 14-year-old Sean Willett in 1986 by luring him into the woods and killing him with a baseball bat. That's the one. Sean Ouellette is my 14-year-old son who was murdered on November 20th, 1986, here in Canton, Massachusetts. When I first saw Sean, I couldn't believe that something that small yet so perfect came for me. His little fingers and his little toes and his little eyelashes, and he was all mine. I was just so thrilled. I was so filled with happiness, and he was so perfect. I hoped that he would become an amazing man. Sean was nowhere to be found. I waited a little while. And then I picked up the phone and I called his friend a few doors down. And I said, is Sean over there? And he said, no, he's not. He said something the other day about going over to one of the other kids at school's house. So I figured, oh, well, that must be what he did. So I waited till around five and I still didn't hear from him. I got concerned. I hopped in my car. I went to the police station. I told them all that I knew. I said, please, I need flood lamps. I need to find him. I knew all these people. I worked with them, the police and the fire department. It was raining and pouring sleet by then. All through the night, we searched. This went on days, nights. We searched and we searched and we didn't find him. On December 11th, 21 days later, I got home. There were police there, and the detective stood up and said to me, Jeannie, we got a letter telling us where we could find Sean, but he's dead. So we found his body. I can't, I can't tell you what else happened for a few hours after that. 
except for one thing. I remember slowly walking outside and you could see the Boston skyline. And I just stood in the middle of the parking lot and I screamed Sean's name. And that's when the whirlwind began. Rod Matthews told state police when they got to the top of the hill, I swung the bat at Sean and I heard a fight and Sean fell to his knees and screamed out, God help me, help me. I quickly realized if I didn't go further, Sean could get up and call police. So Rod Matthews swung the bat again and again until he was sure he was dead. God save me. I've seen a lot of accidents and I've seen a lot of violence. Somebody had pounded the life out of him. And through it all, he still had his little eyelashes, his freckles. Rod Matthews thinks that he killed Sean. He killed me. I was in deep despair. I had so much anger and rage in me. I didn't know what to do. I had nightmares over and over again, not understanding why I couldn't stop the blows from hitting his head. And it was relentless. It was awful. I never thought I'd be free of this, any of this. I had lost hope. It all changed when I met Jacob. After Sean's murder, I had nightmares. It was awful. I hear about Jacob, who's 13 years old, and he's been having nightmares about what happened to Sean. It was like, what's going on here? I was um, a little skeptical. I did not believe in reincarnation. Never believed in it. She was really, really afraid. She was afraid that it was a big hoax. And I told her, we need to reach out and just contact people and make sure everything's on the up and up. And, and if this is true, and I said, I think you need a leap of faith in this one and, and do it. So I decided I would meet Jacob. The day I met Jacob, I was so afraid and so nervous and uptight. Hi. When Jacob walked into the room, can I give you a hug? Sure. I can smell Sean. I can smell my son. Oh my God. I can't tell you how I'm feeling right now, but it's good. Do you feel that the person that's trying to talk through you or be through, be with you or ask for help from you is Sean, is my Sean? I actually do tend to feel that right now because as soon as I saw that you were actually really happy to talk to me. Is that what you thought? Yeah, yeah, it felt much easier to be able to talk. What was he like? He loved to draw. Yeah, I always carry a sketch pad around with me. Do you yeah. really? Yeah. Sean did. My sketch pad. Wondered where they were all going. He had them. All the fears I had that I might be barking up the wrong tree, that this might be nothing was all gone. I think Sean found his way home. That's how I feel right now. I really feel that way, Jacob. Ah, oh, this is just so amazing. I'm, real, I'm so glad you came. Really, I am so glad. I'm sorry that this has been so hard on you. I don't know how to thank you. 
it, in a way, it's kind of worth it now. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, I like, I like to feel awesome right now. Good. Can I have another one of those hugs? Sure. Jacob and I have stayed in touch a lot. How are you? We talk to each other, we text. Hey, Jamie. How are you? Good. He's doing outstanding. He's just so relaxed from that kid that I saw that day walking in the door. If you don't mind me asking, any more nightmares? No. Me neither. I think that's great. I think that's awesome. Oh, that makes yeah. me feel so good. Amazing. It is, it is. The more I get to know Jacob, the more solid it is. And I know that my friendship with Jacob and with his mother, Rebecca, is not only loving, but it's everlasting now. I hate to say goodbye. Yeah. How about see you later? Sure. See you later. <laughs> Jeannie was an amazing person before, but now she's even so much more. So I love to see you. How are you? And it just kind of changed her life. And her heart just got lighter. And the smile is what I appreciate more than anything with her, to see someone so happy. You look good. You did lose weight. 54 pounds. Yeah, I just oh, dropped man. it all off. Yeah. You look wonderful. Which is good. It's very, very peaceful. Yeah. I sleep, sleep in nights. Good, though. You sleep nights, yeah. No nightmares. I, I don't miss them. I think it's wonderful. What a difference in you. It's a miracle. It is a miracle. I am so blessed to have met Jacob and his mother. I now know Sean is safe and Sean is home, and that has made all the difference in the world. It has strengthened me. Who knows what's around the corner for me? But whatever it is, I'm ready to face it. I have high hopes. And that's given me the strength to carry on. My good friend. I love you. I love you too. I can do it. <laughs>